What's up, Joey? How you doing, man? I'm good. How are you? Doing very well. Very well. Yeah, you're a little sideways here. So what if you were to... You're, you're sideways to me, too. Am I? Oh, there you yeah. go. Well, yeah, that's... You wanted, you, you wanted it horizontal, though. Oh, there we go. There you go. Okay. I just, I just had to uh, flip it a few times. Yeah, thanks so much, man. It's, uh, it's an honor <laughs> to have you on. I asked no one. Buffalo, New York. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah. Right. you you don't you have snow you said no snow well out here not just yet not just yet it is the football you're, season. you're in buffalo you said buffalo new york no snow yet um probably back in 06 there was an october storm that just smashed us and, right uh, but besides that you're in la i take it right yeah I'm well aware of the snow in Buffalo. Um, uh, uh, we got snowed in there one time uh, on an early tour with Metallica and Wasp. The famous uh, the police had to escort us out of town. It was crazy, so, super crazy. Wow. Yeah. Well, 1984, 85, early 85. Yeah, Ride the Lightning Tour, March of the Saints. Yep. yep. Damn, I, I met Lars in 2011 in Indio, and I asked him, hey, you know, you got any memories of Buffalo, New York? And he's like, it's probably the first time we were ever snowed in before. <laughs> <laughs> that was the time. <laughs> yes, yes. How was the camaraderie there? I mean, it's like, oh, shit. You know, do you find a hotel, uh, go find a bar or what? Yeah, we were stuck in the hotel for it was at least 48 hours, which isn't like crazy long, but, um, you know, I think we had to cancel the next date because we just couldn't get to it. Um, and, uh, I believe we were in the same hotel with the Metallica guys and, um, you know, yeah, it was just kill time, kill time in the bar and then try to get out of town, you know, cause we all wanted to get to the next show, but none of us could leave um and literally the police had to they had to i don't even remember what they did they must have plowed um a particular route out and then the police escorted the buses out um and then that, we that, got, huh? yeah it was crazy well i love that that's that's the first thing that comes to mind when lars thinks <laughs> of it and and right back at you I'd love to have you come back in buffalo new york and i definitely want to get into the early days of metallica but right here, right now, I'm honored to, uh, you know, I have a few weeks ago, have your singer, John Bush of Armored Saint. And now I'm I lucky. I saw that. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Lucky enough to have Mr. Joey Vera here. And quote to start off, quote, what does your shirt say, by the way? No. No sleep till. No sleep till Metallica or what? Sure. No sleep, <laughs> no sleep till Brooklyn. All it's right. a Brooklyn shirt. It's a clothing company, and obviously in New York, and that's their. Uh, I get it all the time. I'm I'm at the market or something, and someone will just see the shirt. No sleep till Brooklyn. I'm like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> Beastie yeah. Boys fans. Hell yeah. <laughs> Quarter of the day. Well, oh, thanks off. for having us. Thank you oh, for having dude, me, dude. All the way, man. Love cool. what you guys do. Love love your output and your art over the years. Awesome. Um, Today's quote is from an author. I actually read a, this quote this week, uh, an author named Robert Brault. And he said, charisma is not just saying hello. It's dropping what you're doing to say hello. So I'm just going to drop what I'm doing right now and just say hello. And thank you again. This is great. Uh, cool, musical, thank you. Yeah, man. Musical fact of the day. Uh, so today is September the 10th. Big day tomorrow, but September the 10th. Um, in 1964, the number one song in the world was The Kinks, You Really Got Me. Oh, and wow. I didn't know that that was Jimmy Page on the tambourine in that song. Did you know that? I don't think I ever knew that. It, yeah. Is there a tambourine in that song? Uh, I have to listen to it again. <laughs> I'm trying to think, when was the tambourine? But yeah, that's, that's what I read. Um, cool. I had to double check that too. But Jimmy Page. Right on. Good stuff. That's awesome. Joe, uh, Joe Perry of Aerosmith is 71 today. God bless him. And, wow. um, you know, on Sunday, 
your third record with Armored Saint, Raising Fear, turned 34 years old. Damn. 34 years, man. So I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. And do you have any Happy birthday, Raising Fear? Hell yeah, Raising Fear, man. Any memories oh. uh, from recording that record and any, any motivation uh, or maybe inspiration that you had? Because this was just after Cliff Burton's passing. Did he yeah. uh, inspire any of those songs on the record? Well, uh, no, we were already writing during that. It was actually, that period of time was a little bit of a difficult time for us. It was our third record with Chrysalis and it's kind of well known in the press. We were having uh, difficult times with our record company. They didn't quite get us. They didn't really know what to do with us. Um, and so by the time we were making Raising Fear, you know, we had been recording the record, right? So we were writing and uh, it was a kind of a tough time with the label. They wanted us to have like more radio play. They kind of were trying to get us to be more commercial. Uh, at one point, they even hired a, a songwriter to work with us. And so we worked with this guy for like literally two weeks. And then we just said, look, this isn't working. So we had to let him go. And so there was a lot of kind of, uh, you know, hurdles we were trying to get over, let's just say within, with us and Chrysalis Records. We literally wrote and we were in the studio and we recorded about six songs. And then the record company came down and heard it. And they said, okay, you guys just made side two you know, go back and make side one. And we were like, wow, that was, you know, it's not exactly what we wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, as it happened, um, it was during this time, during this kind of this period in which we were recording that we got the news that Cliff Burton had passed away in this tragic accident. So it was during the making of that record and it was a crazy time. Uh, so obviously it was super super sad and super bummed out um and it was it was during this time when they the band was like metallica that is was what are we gonna do you know they were they obviously had to con continue what they were doing it was in the middle of you know their tour obviously in europe and they had to kind of like just get back on their horse and it was an awful period of time for them obviously um and uh, it was during this time that they started reaching out to other bass players that could come in and audition for them. They were having cattle calls at the time. So what that means is there was just basically anybody and their brother was coming in for auditions. And it was just, it was just awful. You know, they were playing with strangers and just having to go through this process was just, it was just an awful time. So they reached out to people that they knew or were friends with or, had got recommendations from and um one day i got a call from lars and he asked me if i was willing to come up and jam with them and just to see what would happen there was no promises it wasn't like they said come up and join it was just like we want to play with some friends would you come up and join i mean come up and jam with us and so i had to kind of make this decision you know i said well let me get back to you tomorrow let me think about it because it's a lot to take in right now. I'm in the middle of making Raising Fear and I'm still with my bros from high school. And there was this whole thing I had to contemplate, you know. And so ultimately I had to decide, am I willing to just stop everything I'm doing now with Armored Saint and just and go up to San Francisco in this for this potential thing, you know. Um, and I had to decide that I wasn't ready for that change in my life. I wasn't ready to just to just throw it all away at, right at that moment. And I didn't want to go up there and just see what happens because I, if I, I knew in my heart that I wasn't ready for that change in my in my heart. So I didn't want to waste their time. I didn't want to waste anybody else's time. I had unfinished business with Armored Saint, so I called him back and I politely declined and I thanked him. It was very nice of them to think of me and you know um and of course uh you know uh jason is also on that on that list of people and so it, it was obviously meant to be the way things turned out but that was when you bring up our uh raising fear and that period of time 
this was part of it, you know, making the record, you know, in the end, uh, we were really, really proud of that record, you know, we're proud of every record that we make. Um, but I remember that period as being just a difficult time because of what we were going through internally uh, with the label and everything. But I think ultimately, we ended up co-producing the record with Chris Minto, the engineer. And so it was our first record doing that. And it was a kind of a start of our career as far as like kind of taking charge of our, the music that we were writing and moving forward from there. So that was a pivotal point, uh, 1987, that was, 86, 87. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, thanks for sharing. Sorry, that was a mouthful. <laughs> hey, dude, I love it. I love it. And I'm sure all of, all of uh, my, my viewers that I'm honored to have will love it too. You mentioned your bros from high school, your bros and an armored saint, you know, just chatting with John Bush and to hear it from the lion's mouth, you know, how he, uh, he was asked to maybe consider to be the new singer of Metallica and James sit back a rhythm guitar. He's like, ah, yeah. I, I'm too, too happy with what my bros. And um, I saw a recent, uh, I'm in real estate, so I'm just going to pause this for a little bit. Um, <laughs> so in James Hadfield, he recently said, he was asked, what comes to mind when you hear Armored Saint? And he just mentioned the brotherhood that those guys have. And um, it's pretty evident. And when you were playing with Metallica in the early 80s, just starting up, your following was that bigger than Metallica in LA? Uh, how was how was that? That was, that was pre Cliff, right? It was. You know, by the time they moved up north to San Francisco, um, uh, they moved fairly early on. So we we didn't really. It took us about a year to get quote unquote big, where we were selling out clubs uh, regularly. Um, but you got to keep in mind that the period of time this is. So this is like 1982 into 83. And so during that time, you had a lot of activity in L.A. It was a lot of competition, you know, Wasp, Rat, Black and Blue, you know, uh, you know, uh, just to name a couple of bands, um, Great White, you know, there was a lot of competition. Um, and so all these bands were doing the same thing and also getting big, also selling out clubs. So um, by the time that Metallica moved up north, I mean, it was early on. It was it was before we, you know, we were selling out clubs, you know, so we were kind of on this sort of equal trajectory, you know, but yep. they just went to San Francisco before either one of us were really doing well on the clubs. Um, I remember. In fact, I remember seeing Cliff with uh, Trauma at the Troubadour, and this was before Metallica moved up north. So it was shortly after they, obviously that show, they saw him too. They were there and they said, that guy's going to be our bass player. <laughs> so of course, as you know, everyone knows the story, Cliff said, well, if you want me to join your band, you got to move up to San Francisco. So, <laughs> yep. um, but, um, you know, it was a cool time to be in L.A. Uh, a lot of almost no matter what night of the week you went out, you could see any one of those bands and lots of other bands from that era. And it was a it was a great time. I'm sure. And what was your relationship yeah. like with Cliff Burton? Is there a word that you'd best describe him? Um, unique. He's a he's a very unique uh, person with a unique, unique personality and he's had his own style. Every, you know, it's common knowledge, people that have ever met him or seen, uh, seen him on interviews or stuff like that. He has a certain demeanor that was unique to him, um, but a uh, super sweet, awesome down to earth guy, you know, kind of like if I had to sum it up, you know, it would be just a no bullshit down to earth guy, you know, no pretenses um, and uh, just super unique and warm. Um, I got to spend a little bit of time with him. I mean, we did a few tours with them. So I obviously spent time with him on the road, you know, but it's a working relationship out there and it's, it's a little different, but I had the opportunity of hanging out with them. I think it was when they played Day on the Green and they were obviously this is a couple years later they were much bigger and that legendary show that they played and we were recording um delirious nomad at the time 
And um, so this was 80, late 85, early 86. And um, Dave Pritchard and I, after the recording session one night, we said, day on the greens tomorrow, we could get in because we had we knew management still and we, we could get in. We, we just got to get up there. So if we left at like three in the morning or something and we drove straight up to San Francisco, went to the show, we were completely burnt, but it was a great, great show and stuff. So we were up there and uh, Lars and uh, the guys shared a house. I think it was Lars, James and Cliff shared a house. And they said, uh, you guys could spend the night if you want, just crash on the couch. So yeah. Dave, Dave and I did that. We stayed at their house in El Cerrito. And it was during that time, that time when that night, in fact, we were just playing music, hanging out. And they had just played a rad show and it was awesome. And Cliff was showing me his record collection. And we were talking about like Stanley Clark and talking about jazz fusion because he was way into that stuff, as was I. So we kind of were like just geeking out on, you know, <laughs> his favorite Stanley Clark records or whatever. And so that was a cool, special time for me. Just a one-on-one -on -one moment that I got to have with Cliff. That's amazing. And yeah. the smell there on Carlson, Carlson Boulevard in that house in El Cerrito. I mean, was there shit all over the place, Chinese food or, or what? No, no. It was, I mean, you know, you, you want to hear, you want to, and not when I was there, maybe other days there was. <laughs> but, but no, it was, you know, it's just a suburban house. It was, you know, it was the party pad, obviously, you know, a lot of people know, knew about it and it was the place to hang. Everyone wanted to be around them for obvious reasons. There was a certain energy going on there. Um, I believe they were writing for what would become uh, Master of Puppets. So. Um, they were i didn't get to hear anything or that would, there was i didn't see anything like that but um you know just rad vibe there you know yeah and it's just crazy how hatfield turned the wood from that garage into a guitar that he uses to this day which yeah. is so wild and i think yeah. hanging out you know with metallica talking metallica with me because it is their 40th anniversary this year um their black album box set just came out i got it two days early yeah uh, which is just a just a wild wild thing so i'm number i'm looking at this for the first time here so thirty thousand five hundred sixty seven out of wow 520 uh yeah five hundred twenty thousand. that's awesome really good stuff um, yeah didn't didn't the covers record come out today too or yes is that, or yesterday or something yeah the blacklist record yeah yeah today as well and i asked john um you know hey what what song would you cover by metallica and he mentioned wherever i may roam and <laughs> is there one off the black album that you would love to cover or champion uh i don't know uh, i always loved sad but true yeah uh, it's really heavy i always i love i always love the really slow heavy stuff yeah yeah, yeah. I, I thought they, that was, this was a great song, you know. Obviously, that whole record is great, but it's one yeah. of those records where every song is killer. I, I just found out that the Black Album and Dark Side of the Moon, Pink Floyd, are the only two records, studio records, ever to be charting on the US, in the U.S. for 600 weeks or more. So Dark Side of the Moon and Black Album sold a shit ton of records. And, uh, um, you know, when I think about you, Joey Vera of Armored Saints and Fate's Warning and Merciful Fate, um, <laughs> was the Fillmore, the 2011 30th anniversary shows. Uh, my twin brother and I were right up front every single night. Um, we call it the Fillmore flu. Everyone got sick staying in line there in December, but it was all fucking worth it, man. But to see you up there, your mohawk and your funky, your funky hair, do you, do you got that, the, the towel in the back right now? Yeah, or? still there. Okay. Yeah. Right. It's still there hanging on i just remember your bass face you know you get that that bass face when you're just you're getting you're getting into it and <laughs> that you could just see this and uh that was my first impression of of you because i know you were a guy from the past and how was that experience opening for metallica on one of those nights there and that whole experience it was awesome it was uh pretty surreal um you know first of all we were just extremely honored that we were even invited there um you know we 
you know, we knew we, we have this kind of uh, connection with them from our past, but, you know, you never take that stuff for granted. So, you know, it's not like you, uh, when we heard about this show coming up, we, and they invited us, it was sort of like, really, why do you want us there? <laughs> like, what, what's the deal with that? But, uh, you know, they reassured everyone involved that it was, they wanted to be with people that meant something to them coming up. And to have us included in that sentence is like, it's just an honor, you know? So um, we looked up to them coming up just like a lot of other bands did, you know? And uh, so it's kind of cool to hear from them that in some small way they had similar feelings towards us. So um, it's a camaraderie that is is a genuine thing and we never took that for granted. So to be there was just surreal. Uh, it was a rad vibe in the room. As you know, you were there. It was just a big party to celebrate the band and um, their history and what they've accomplished and and also for their fans, you know, who were one of a kind people and uh to just it was just an awesome 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 thing to be involved in so it was a lot of fun you know it went by way too fast you know as those things go sometimes uh i wish i could rewind and memorize it slower but uh it was a rush i mean coming on stage it was it was pretty awesome you know a little funny little kind of side story about that is that you know, we went up there and we were like, yeah, you know, because San Francisco for us is kind of like our second home. And so, you know, it's going to be amazing. You know, we're going to go out and it's we're going to, you know, we're going to just have fun and we're going to tear it up. and It's going to be great. So like midway through, we're, we start playing a song, a couple of songs. I think we played, I don't know, three or four songs. I can't remember exactly how many. We played a few songs, though. And after the first song ended, we were kind of like, how come the crowd's not going nuts for us? Like, <laughs> this, yeah. you know, we actually had to work hard to like, you know. Yeah. To, and we're like, what's going on? If they're not like falling all over us, like, wait a minute. And so uh, it was just a funny, uh, it was, a, this was like afterwards, we sort of were looking back on that and going, you know, that was like a lot of work. It wasn't so easy. <laughs> right right but it was it, great it was the fans were amazing I'm, I'm not saying that the fans didn't appreciate it but it wasn't like we came out and like oh my god it's Robert say we love you you know <laughs> i get the chills you mentioning that man because i i agree <laughs> I, I was looking up the left and the right side of the rail at times throughout that entire week i'm like where's the where's the vibe lou reed's here man he's that's fucking lou reed <laughs> or uh you know i was i was uh mer merciful fate Dude, they came out. Uh, it was it was uh, Timmy, Hank, mm, um, yeah, and all those guys. First time performing together since '93. I, I got hair down to my shoulders every riff, you know, hitting it. And um, I remember that was the first performance King Diamond had after his his heart surgery. Mm. And uh, he pointed right at me between. He's like, "That's right." It was, <laughs> that was one of my all time moments actually uh, at a show. So amazing times there. Yeah, uh, it was fun. Future sponsor liquid death uh sparkling water I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna have a sip here do it symbol of salvation next month october the 22nd you got the cd dvd coming out from yeah. the performance of the entire record uh metal blade that's right uh metal played blade. the album in its entirety and um yeah. it was a lot of fun doing uh we we uh, had an oppor opportunity to do it a couple years ago it was recorded in 2018 but uh, we knew that this, that this uh, anniversary was coming up. So rather than wait, I'm glad we didn't because look what happened with yeah. this whole world. But um, we decided to document, go out and document the show. So we had fun doing it and it was great. Um, it looks so, like a lot of fun. You know, yeah. Like, it's uh, Nikki from the label. Um, and by the way, I had Brian Slagle on. Really great chat. Awesome, awesome. guy. Yeah, but I watched the entire performance, black and white. Um, I'm going to be typing a review up for for the label. I don't know if they're going to publish it or whatever. So uh, mm. really enjoyed it. I think John Bush, after all these years, still has that same voice. You guys got that vigor up on stage. You, it's a brotherhood. You guys are enjoying it. And some of those deep cuts on there that you guys haven't performed before. 
Um, I think John Bush uh, wears his heart on his sleeve in between some of the songs with some of the comments. So um, yeah. I was connecting with that. That's for sure. Yeah. So Good. yeah, October 22nd, next month, check it out. CD, DVD. I'll include a yep. load of some information on that. Um, Great. But you had a solo record called A Thousand Faces mm. uh, with a cool video with your shirt off and you're walking around all chill. And it's a it's a catchy number, man. I like that song. And I, I didn't know you had a solo record, actually. Um, so that was, I mean, I was six years old. So uh, that was nice. <laughs> a Thousand Faces. And shortly after that, you joined a band called Fate's Warning. Uh, Prague yeah. out of Connecticut in 96, you joined them. I understand. <laughs> That's right. And um, you guys have taken a band called Headless out in Europe. And I just had my buddies, uh, my new friends from Italy. I'm 50% Sicilian, even though I don't look it. But Walter and Dario from Headless. Um, Good guys. They had great things to say about you. And apparently there was some Riesling drank in Germany on a day off or something. Do you remember that? <laughs> uh, in in uh, Greece, wasn't it? Uh, or wait, Germany. Riesling. Well, we, that's the thing is that we often discussed wine with those guys because Dario was way into it. Um, and so we would have discussions about, you know, different wines and, the, you know, the qualities of wine and all that kind of stuff. Him being from Italy, obviously knew a lot about wine and a lot more about the Italian wines than I do because the Italian wines, as you probably know, are idiosyncratic. The, the grape varieties are really idiosyncratic to the area. So it's like there's, you know, there's so much to know that I, I, I don't, I don't only scratch the surface of it, you know? So, uh, but Dario was way into it. And um, I believe he busted out a bottle for us at our last show if I'm not mistaken, which was in, in Greece, I think. Um, and so we got to sit down and actually share a bottle together. Um, but maybe it was the Riesling and maybe we did share a Riesling in Germany, but I thought it was the last show in, in Greece that he, and he supplied the wine because he yeah. brought it from home maybe or something was saving it for the end or something. Um, but we had a good time and sat around and drank it out of paper cups, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Walter apparently had to cut Dario off, uh, just drinking too much of that Riesling. It had to have been in Germany or was it in Greece? You know, it's tough to remember <laughs> all that vino, I'm sure. I know, it's brain cells. <laughs> yep, yep. We have a new record coming out uh, uh, September the 24th called Square Oh, great. Pound, which, That's great. Uh, yeah, man, it's sounding good. You know, the 80s influence and... Um, and know, didn't they, weren't they hired to... Um, I think it's them. Were they hired to support um, Jeff Tate's band? Did they play with Jeff Tate so as his backing band? There's a support. Um, they're going to be announcing that. I don't know which what's going to happen there, but it's supposed to be next year. Uh, it's supposed to be opening up for a big, uh, one of those 80s bands. Not uh, Motley Crue, Poison, Def Leppard, but maybe a mm. Great White or, or Jeff Tate or something like that. Cool. Cool. Um, my dad hosts a, a wine television show for the past 11 years here. It's called Spirit oh, yeah? Wine. Cool. Um, I like wine. I like beer. I think I'm a little bit more of a beer fan. But with wine, what, what kind of wine do you like? Do you like California cabs or Zins? Or well, uh, I like uh, I like a lot of wine. I think if I had to if I had to choose my favorites, um, I, I tend to go more for old world styles like uh, France and Italy, you know, even Spain and Greece make great wines. Um, but I think my favorites are probably Chateauneuf du Pops, which are kind of uh, blends, obviously. Mouvedre is one of the main grapes um, from that blend. Um, but I also love Pinot Noir. Um, and uh, in particular, if we're talking, I mean, Pinot Noir is obviously across the board of, in, in the places where it grows well. France, of course, you know, Burgundy is amazing, of course. But um, since a lot of that's really overpriced, in my opinion, <laughs> I look for it elsewhere. Um, Oregon produces great Pinots, as well as California. And one of my favorite wineries 
is in California. It's called Melville. And they kind of specialize in an old world style of Pinot Noirs. Um, so my wife and I kind of belong to their club and we drive up there often. They're just outside Santa Barbara here in California. Central Coast. Yeah, it's really great place. Uh, just it's, it's a great drive, a great place to hang out anyway and get out of the city for a while. But uh, so we go up there often and they make uh, amazing Pinot Noir, but they also make really great um, Chardonnays as well. Um, very old world again in the Chardonnay, not very unoaked and uh, just more uh, drier and steelier than what's commonly made in California. I think there's a tendency to bring out the too much fruit. I, listen to me. I sound like a wine snob here. Yeah, look at you, man. <laughs> But I, uh, you know, I like wine, you know, but I like it to be uh, balanced and, and subtle rather than hit you over the head. Like this. I'm not a big fan of the California cabs because a lot of them tend to do that. Not saying they're all like that because there are some great makers of cabs out here. Yeah. But a lot of the styles in general are just way too fruit forward for me. Sure. There you have it. There's my, there's yeah. my wine review. <laughs> You're, you're a pro, man. You're a pro. So Melville on the Central Coast, what's uh, yeah. what do you like most about it? Is it great views, good people? Yeah, the, the area is just beautiful. Um, it's uh, it's kind of mountainous. And so it's just, uh, you know, the terrain is just beautiful. And when you get up, when you get up there, there's this vineyard after vineyard. Um, it's, it's it's a great area to, to visit. Um, it's just outside Lompoc kind of near Santa Maria. Um, and uh, it's just, they make great, there's a lot of great wineries up there. It's a, it's a cool place to just get out of town. It's not that far either, my friend, from LA. It's, you can get up there in like an hour and a half. So it's oh, not bad. very, it's a very, very short drive. And the next thing you know, you feel like you're, you know, in another state kind of, you know. Yeah. But it's a, it's a great place to just, to get away for, for a few hours. Yeah, for sure. Sure. We go up there a few, 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 we spend time up there. Sometimes we'll spend three or four days and just tool around and visit the wineries and just hang out. And my daughter loves it too up there. So it's cool. Beautiful. And yeah. how's, how's your family doing with, with all this COVID bullshit and everything? Well, thank you for asking. We're, we're good. Um, we are one of the lucky ones. We've gotten through this unscathed. And I know that not everyone has had that experience i think that it's been a lot of it's some people have had suffered loss and suffered uh homelessness um it's a it's a problem here even in this big city of la um, it's been apparent that it's affected a lot of people in a negative way uh we've unscathed we've come out of it unscathed uh yeah. so far um i've had a few family members that have gotten it gotten it but not to the point where they've had to go to the hospital so um Good. we're we're the one of the lucky ones all my friends and family have are are okay um so like i said we're grateful that we're we're lucky we still have a home over our heads and we're healthy and can't say i can't say that it's been too bad <laughs> you know yeah very happy for to us. Hear that. that's that's awesome and you have some time to get away a little bit and uh Awesome. King Diamond, uh, he, he likes to drink a little wine before he, he hits the stage, I understand. And uh, how I love Merciful Fate. It was the medley when I heard at age 15, Metallica's medley, you know, Headfield 98, he said, uh, they jam more riffs into a song than anyone else. And, and it's all just that groove. Yeah. How the hell did you get hooked up with Merciful Fate? And, and what's your relationship like with King Diamond? <laughs> yeah you just reminded me of uh you know starting to do my homework again because um i was supposed to do these tours with them two years ago and um it, this that keeps getting postponed so um there is a lot of riffs in one song um i started to go back on my cheat sheets here i can't show you the songs because i can't give away what we're playing but like these are some of my cheat sheets and there's a lot of parts there's a lot of things to remember um that, that was just one song and this is just another song you know so Whoa. it's like you know every song's just got like there's very little that repeats itself <laughs> dude, dude 
No sleep till purple <laughs> state, man. No sleep. Yeah, I know. You know that shit. But um, I'm excited about it. It's cool. Um, you know, I've been friends with um with King in particular for for a while. I've, I've known him mostly through just, you know, the circle of being in metal bands kind of, you know, but maybe more directly through Metal Blade because they they were obviously signed to Metal Blade early on as well. And so just, you know, through Brian Slagle and just through the connections through the label, basically, I would go see King or I'd go see, you know, King Diamond Solo or I would see Merciful Fate. Um, actually, I never, I didn't ever see Merciful Fate, but I've seen King a few, a bunch of times. And so we just would become friends that way. And so when I was on tour in 17, no, 2018 with uh, Fate's Warning, we played through Dallas um, and uh, King Diamond and Brian Slagle happened to be there that night. And so he, Brian said, I I'm going to bring King to the show. He wants to come see the show and meet you guys. And it's like, great. So he came down and, um, you know, whatever, everything was great. We were hanging out in our dressing room and King pulled me aside and he told me what was going on with Timmy and basically asked me if, if it didn't, if he wasn't able to do the shows, if I want, was willing to fill in for him. And I was like, what? what? I was like, what do you mean? It was just crazy. So I said, you know, I, yeah, let me think about it and we'll talk in a couple of days and then so we talked on the phone a few days later and uh you know he, he was just he told me a little bit more about the situation you know at the time timmy was going through um chemotherapy and they weren't sure if he was going to be physically able to do it but he was intending to do it and so i said well you know yeah i mean if I, I'll, I'll be in the batter's box or i'll be in the you know in the circle if you want me to come out um, I'll, be, I'll try to be ready for it, you know, so, um, super honored, of course, that they would even ask me. Uh, and I kind of thought like, this is just not real. It's crazy. And then I also, in the back of my mind, I figured, well, he's going to pull through, you know, it'll be okay. And then a couple of months went by and he ended up passing away. I was just like shocked, you know, uh, obviously and saddened. I met Timmy back in the day and he was a great guy. Um, sweetheart and an amazing player and i was well aware of all his bass lines and these songs uh so i suddenly had to change my thinking like okay dude like you said you would fill in and now you have to step up i was like oh my god this is a crazy responsibility and stuff so i have i'm gonna honor that honor that uh, offer so yeah so that's kind of how i got pulled into this and uh I'm stoked to to do this. I, like again, this is I, I still don't feel like it's real because it keeps getting postponed. Yeah. So um, I was doing my homework for that show. The first shows were supposed to be in 2020, and so uh, Vegas, Psycho Vegas, was it? Well, the Psycho Vegas was at the end of it. There was uh, like a whole slew of European festivals that summer, and so. COVID comes along, changes all that. It's got postponed to this summer. Then this summer got postponed until next summer. So now apparently it's happening next summer in 22. Um, so if all goes right, I should be doing that. So I'm now I'm, as again, I just showed you my cheat sheets. <laughs> Gotta get back on the books and do the homework again. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been really cool, you know, visiting these songs again. And, uh, I mean, I've heard all these songs for years, you know, but I'd never learned them, you know, before. So hence the cheat sheets, you know, there's a lot to remember and a lot of parts. And um, it's really, really cool going back and learning this material. It's classic stuff. From what I'm told, we're only doing um, early stuff only. Um, I don't know exactly what the set list is, but I have a pretty good chunk of it so far. Uh, so it's been really, really great. And um, for me, it's this really weird circle because, um, I, again, like I have to pinch myself when I talk about it because it hasn't actually happened yet, you know. Right. So if it does happen, it's going to be amazing. Like I'm going to be like, oh my God, I'm actually on stage with 
freaking merciful <laughs> fate playing like you know this stuff that's like and there's king and then there's you know hank is next to me it's like it's gonna be crazy <laughs> so um uh you know when i was coming up and saint was starting out back in you know 82 when we first started getting to going you know i was kind of part of the early tape trading i had pen pals over in europe and we would share uh, music back and forth um people don't know what that is this is before the before the internet before a lot of things but you know no internet you only had Kerrang magazine and you only had you know the classified ads in the back of Kerrang and other magazines where you could get people's addresses and find people that were into stuff that you were into and you could exchange you know I'll send you you know demo tapes of bands that are playing in LA and you tell me and you send me tapes that are bands that are playing in Holland or in Germany or Denmark or something and so one of my pen pals sent me the first Merciful Fate EP, um, which at the time was really hard to get here in LA. I'd seen them, seen their name in Kerrang, but I didn't know anything about them. So, you know, like my connection with them was like, I, I loved that EP. I played the crap out of it. It was, of course, on a cassette, played the shit out of it. And so, you know, I mean, just to be fast forwarded until now, and we're talking about me, I might be playing some of those songs on stage with these guys. It's like completely surreal. And, you know, yeah. I'm totally stoked though. It's gonna be amazing. Um, yeah. So I'm really looking forward to it. And when, not if, but when it happens, I'm sure you're gonna be up on stage with your in-ears and you're gonna hear King Diamond's <laughs> falsetto hit and you see all the smiling faces all around. You're just gonna look to your right like, just kind of forget that you're playing i'm sure yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be a trip and and because you mentioned it i'm gonna think about this conversation again and i'm gonna remember that and go oh my god that's actually happening <laughs> boom 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 i i love it man right on uh, i uh, you, you distracted me with that comment a little bit but again i just want to say we got joey vera here bassist co-founder of armored saints bassist of fate's warning and merciful fate and if there's any requests from uh, Kevin in Buffalo, New York, go Bills, um, <laughs> is Legend of the Headless Rider, Mad Arab, you know, Mandrake, Banshee. I know it's 90s stuff, time, you know, but the 80s stuff, that's that's great. And I can't wait to be there and see it uh, cool. ourselves. want to ask you this before uh, we move on. New shit, Merciful Fate. How's the songwriting going for the new music? Well, I don't know how much I'm supposed to divulge on that. Um, they are writing. And um, I honestly haven't heard anything. I've heard a few songs, um, only music though, and nothing with vocals yet. So um, I've heard a few songs. In fact, they've asked me to play on a few of their demos and I, I have played on one song so far. Um, but um, I think that they're uh, still writing and it's going good from what I understand. Um, musically, what I heard was, was great. It was just right in the, you know, right in the wheelhouse of what you would expect from Merciful Fate. Um, great, you know, riffs um, and just, you know, the songs are going to be amazing. So that's all I can really say. <laughs> It's good enough. Good enough for me. Good enough for us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for every new subscriber here on I Asked No One, I make a little donation to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. So appreciate the support of uh, viewers. If you like what you're seeing so far, a little like, subscribe is really, really appreciated. A little over a year into this project of mine. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a pinch me merciful fate kind of moment to be doing this right now. So um, it's great. Our, Congratulations. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Project 2025 is what we're calling it. Uh, we want to decrease the suicide rate by 20% by the year 2025. I'll be going to the Attica State Prison next year to, uh, there's correctional facilities, there's 30% uh, higher of a chance of suicide in these places. So, um, you know, I'll be doing my part there. And I right. know we, we unfortunately lost Michael Howe of Metal Church, your buddy. And John yeah. Lynch, uh, had some nice things to say about him. 
Uh, anything yeah. you care to disclose about Mike and uh, and what your relationship was like with him? Well, you know, as you've probably, as many people have probably read about him, uh, that his uh, his personality was just uh, he was just a sweet guy. Um, it's all true, you know. Um, you know, and I something I something that I mentioned that when he passed, something that I wrote, and and it really was true. Like, no matter what. Uh, we we were on tour with with them for a few different times uh, in the last uh, seven years or so, and a uh, great band to tour with, Metal Church. And um, as I said, and I wrote this before, and it really is true, and it bears repeating, I guess, is that no matter what you were doing during the day, uh, but you know, we we're on tour, and it's the daily grind, and it's the same thing over and over, and sound checks and sometimes a shitty venue or, you know, it's cold or you're sick or you're tired or, you know, there's something, you know, touring is not easy. It's not for everybody. Um, and, but you could always count on Mike to crack a smile for you. And he had this way of just kind of like lifting your spirits about no matter what was going on in your day that day. And so that's, you know, a testament to his, his personality and his heart, you know, he was a great guy. Um, and I always kind of counted on that from him. And I, uh, I appreciated it, you know, and I had a lot of, a lot of time hanging out with him. He was often, uh, hanging out with us. Um, he wasn't so much of a partier or like a drinker really, but he would still like to spend time with us and hang out with us. You know, in fact, I think one tour we shared a bus together, and uh, just, it was, you know, a great, just a great time is being able to just sit with him and hang out and chat about bullshit, nothing, sometimes talk politics, or sometimes you would talk about nothing. And uh, never had a mean thing to say about anybody. And um, he was just an awesome guy and, and sadly missed, you know, and, and to be honest with you, I, I really had no idea that, that he was suffering with with anything mentally I, I really didn't know it wasn't something he talked about um you know i just i was just flabbergasted when this when i heard the news and, and I, as i think most of us are um and it's just i just wish you know it's, you, you say this everyone says the same thing and i wish he would have reached out you know i could have helped him somehow or said something and maybe it would have changed it you know everybody wants to say that and feel that maybe I don't know much about mental illness I don't have that much experience with it but I know it's very real and I know it's a very difficult thing it's harder uh, for a lot of us who don't understand it to really grasp it you know and for people that are suffering it's it's, I know that they see no way out and it's a very d difficult thing for them to go through it. But, you know, as, as I'm sure you say more often than not, we want people to stop and take a deep breath and just reach out to someone and say something and just, it could be the slightest little question and, but it could make all the difference. Depression certainly has uh, no face. And Jerry Cantrell, when Chris Cornell happened, Chris Cornell, he, he was the last person this could happen to. And you see how how much Chester Bennington and Lincoln Park had it, you know, and that yeah. happens. Um, I got the soldier right there. Yeah. But, uh, Mike Howell forever, and thank you. Um, yeah. yeah. So, Mike Howell's amazing. Then never forget. Yeah. Good. Tomorrow is 20 years since september the 11th i yeah i, I was like what uh yeah, that's crazy where were you when this happened just curious well i was home and uh we my wife and i had gone out to see um sabotage uh the night before at house of blues here in la when house of blues was still open in hollywood it's not there anymore but we went out and we were I'm friends with those guys. So um, we went out, had a great night, drank way too much, um, you know, didn't drive home, but we we were hung over like hell the next morning. And for some reason, and this isn't something that we normally do, but like we when we got up in the morning, 
we turned on the TV and we don't normally do that, <laughs> but something compelled us to turn on the TV. Um, and the images were right away on, because it was on every channel, of course. And we were just like dumbfounded. Um, it, it, you know, talk about surrealism. That was just the most surreal thing. We were, we sat there literally motionless for a few seconds, and we were like, "What are we looking at?" We, I, I, we even said to each other, "What what is this? You know, what what's what is that? What is happening?" You know. Um, and by the time we were so for Pacific Coast, we're in Los Angeles, so it had already happened in New York. So we were watching the aftermath of what had actually happened and still it was just completely surreal couldn't believe it um it was certainly you know i mean my god <laughs> what a dark day that was you know yep yep i'll sure. never forget that though it was just it was again we were you know feeling slightly elated you know with hangover included yeah. uh just you know having a good time with friends from out of town and and having it, watching a good show and feeling good and like you know that was a fun night you know and then the, the like soon after that you're looking at the world it was like what's it was forever changed you know it was crazy yeah, yeah. You certainly count your blessings and uh, god bless america and when we finally got osama bin laden i think it was uh the day before a godsmack show and um next week uh the girl that's on Godsmack's debut record, she's going to be joining me, Tony Tiller. She's going to be mm -hmm. a, a pretty fun conversation. Cool. Uh, Sully Erna went up on the mic, and right before the enemy, he said something along the lines of, he put a middle finger up, is, we got that cocksucker in the Middle East, fuck that motherfucker, and he went right into the enemy. And uh, I've, I've been at shows, you know, where you, uh, holy crap, you know, you're just feeling it. It's this out-of-body experience, as I'm sure you've had over the years. Uh, on stage and off stage, but to, to rock out to to some to a feat like that that happened, um, yeah, we live in the greatest country. We got us so lucky, man. I got a twin brother uh, lives in Athens, Greece. He's loving it out there, but um, you know, it's a half court swish being born into this beautiful country, and, and I love it. So, yeah, thanks for sharing. We're lucky. Yes, yeah. we're very lucky. John Bush and you are R and B fans. Um, are, you talking, <laughs> are you talking like Seal, Kiss from a Rose, or, uh, nah. or you know Mary J. Blige, or, or nah. more like old Stevie school. Wonder, right? Yeah. yeah, old school stuff. Stevie Wonder, Sly Stone, Temptations, yeah, Brothers Johnson. You guys, oh, yeah. Earth, on the Earth, Wind, and Fire. Yeah, you guys on the bus is trading songs or. You know, just yeah. introducing each other to some new shit. Yeah, I mean, you know, we we uh, we just we grew up in the same and that same frame of mind. You know, I think in Los Angeles, uh, the radio here was uh, you could hear a lot of different music on the radio here. You could hear, uh, you know, we had you know rock stations that were playing you know music of the time, which in the seventies was you know. It was that of the music of the times. It was current music then was, you know, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, Aerosmith, you know, uh, Ted Nugent, Cheap Trick, uh, you know. It wasn't called classic rock then because it was current then. So, you know, you could have stations like that and then you, on a couple of beats over on the radio, you hear Sly Stone or Earth, Wind & Fire or Stevie Wonder. Um, so, you know, it's like just some amazing stuff, you know, Temptations. Um, what, what temptation song should i check out i'm not too familiar with them Joey. oh well there's a lot i mean their yeah. their career was pretty far spanned so you, you could you could check out a lot of stuff i i would go towards for me the the 70s period was the, was the great period um they also have obviously they were active in the mid 60s or early mid 60s and it was a little more pop oriented then obviously uh you know most music most music was but for me when it got a little dirtier and grittier it was great there's a song called um i'm losing you 
which you should check out. It's kind of near the bridge of the 60s stuff, but going into the 70s, I forget what record, it came, what year it came out, maybe 69, 70. Okay. But uh, it was just a great song. Awesome. Um, and there's a lot of different versions of it. There's live versions and studio versions, but I suggest going to the studio versions first. Um, just great stuff. Done. Um, yeah. Yeah. You got to check that out. Um, but, you know, you can check out, uh, there's another band called Rare Earth, um, which is a little more rock, but they were also kind of considered an R&B group. Um, but they're a little more kind of electric guitars and stuff like that. Um, I Just Want to Celebrate is a song that kind of was really popular and Metallica actually covered that um, yeah. um, once. And, uh, but the, their Rare Earth version is amazing. You got to check that out um, if you haven't heard it yet. So there's a lot of great stuff, you know, Sly Stone, just, I mean, Earth, Wind and Fire. Some of those guys were influences on me as a bass player, you know, Larry Graham from Sly Stone and Virginia so, White. How so are putting just, into metal? Just, you know, I mean, just being rubbing off on me, the music uh, was, you know, the bass parts are very prominent in, in uh, it's, yeah. we're talking about Verdine White and Larry Graham here, of course. Yeah. Um, you know, so the, the so bass, bass parts bass are like, like that, right? They're in your face and they, they're moving, they make you dance, they make you groove, they're melodic. And uh, so when I started to play in, in, you know, rock bands and metal bands a little bit later, you know, I was into, you know, Aerosmith and Judas Priest and Scorpions and Thin Lizzy and Queen and Sabbath, you know, and all that stuff. So, but I found a way to, you know, not always, but I always tried to find a way to make the music groove and not just play what the guitar players were playing, but make the bass parts their independent part. And part of that comes from listening to R&B bands, you know, Larry Graham and Verdine White in particular. So, um, that's how I tried to approach even some of the early bass parts in the first Ar uh, Armored Saint records. You know, there's sections or parts where you can kind of hear the bass bouncing along with the drums and not playing the guitar part. And that's sort of a dir direct influence that I'm taking from my uh, love of R&B. <laughs> there are some Armored Saint songs that stand out to you that bring that bass up, you know, from R&B style that that us viewers should go listen to? Well, I mean, there's, I mean, I've been able to kind of get away with it more, more recently. Yeah. So like some of the songs on uh, Punching the Sky or even Wind Hands Down, um, you know, there's a song called, on Wind Hands Down, there's a song called, um, uh, uh, Exercise in Debauchery, for instance. There's a few sections in that song where uh, the bass goes independent and kind of bounces around. So that's a song that you would hear the bass kind of playing a groove part that's, you know, it's just a groovy part. It's not necessarily a metal part, but it's but it still grooves with what's going on in the, in the song. So yeah. that's, that's one to maybe go look at, Exercise and Debauchery from Wind Hands Down. From Punch in the Sky, I really like the lone wolf, you know, it's and oh, cool. I didn't realize how much of a good actor John Bush is. I was literally laughing, you know, <laughs> watching. Some yeah. yeah, yeah, that was fun to make. Uh, really cool. Uh, kind of a first for us, you know, taking a song and and adding, uh, you know, a lot of narrative to the story rather than just a performance thing, you know. And, uh, you know, and just again, we've, we're always about trying to do things a little different, take some chances, you know, and and go outside of our comfort zones, you know, and, and uh, that was, that was uh, outside John's comfort zone, you know, um, doing, doing that and being kind of like the sole, uh, you know, the sole character in the, in the, in the story. He's never really done that before. And so he was really nervous, you know, and I said, you know, just, just be yourself, you know, and like part of your, I was trying to help him with the getting character, you know, I was like, part of your whole deal is like, you're, you know, you're, you're just like, you're ambivalent. You're just, you're not one thing or the other. You're just sort of in your own head, you know? So just do that. Just be in your own head and don't think about it, you know? So he, he pulled it off. I thought he did really good. And it was a fun thing to, to do. Uh, 
and uh, you know, and Lone Wolf is another song that's kind of got a little bit of R and B uh, thing going on in it too. Um, so that that's another song that I uh, that I I'm kind of proud about, and you know, and and writing, you know, uh, musically speaking, there's chord changes in there that um, I'm sorry if I'm going on a tangent here, but oh please, thank you. <laughs> But there's a the section and it's a B section. And there's a verse part and then it goes into this B section, which is the same as the bridge of the song. And it's really just a set of three chords that I came up with goofing around on my guitar and kind of playing it like an R&B tune. So almost with a, you could imagine it with a wah-wah pedal maybe or something, waka, 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 you know? And it's just three chords. And um I was playing these three chords over and over and I got, this is a cool part. This is amazing. So I changed the bass part and I made it into this little part. And it was a little R and B part. But then I'm like, wouldn't it be cool if I could put this into a context of a metal song? And so the end result of that is Lone Wolf. So. Bad ass. Love it. Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> and the Academy Award goes to John Bush. You know it. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. Last few questions here. And, and by the way, again, Joey Vera here with Armored Saint, Fate's Warning, Merciful Fate. Um, and Motor Sister. And Motor Sister. There's a few other. <laughs> Motor Sister. Can't forget about Motor Sister. There's a few other active bands that you're in right now, Joey? Uh, those are the only active ones for now. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's plenty at this point. It's, it's getting hard to keep schedules from not stepping on each other, even just with those bands. Um, but yeah, Motor Sister has a new record we just finished um, and we're just getting the artwork together now. So that should be coming out sometime in 22 with any luck. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's it's a cool record. We're, we're excited about it too. And um, and Fate's Warning, you know, has a new record too. It's, it's crazy with COVID, you know, like Armored Saint has a new record. Fate's Warning has a new record. Neither one of us has been on tour yet, you know, but hopefully we will soon. And, you know, I'm just I'm lucky that I can even say that I'm still working and at least recording with bands and, and being involved in making videos or whatever. So uh, hopefully this all opens up soon. So, yeah, so get surely getting there, you know, hopefully. And, uh, you know, you're really keeping yourself busy, it sounds like, and I take a lot of inspiration from that, honestly, uh, from from what you and John Bush have been doing and filling your time with, and you just, you're getting creative, you know, what's a, you're staying creative, and there's a song on there, on the new record uh, from 2020, Punching the Sky, Armored Saint, called End of the Attention Span. Hmm. So it's really easy, I mean, in my business, you know, this is, <laughs> this is just the texting and stuff, but there's people that just, to have mm. a conversation uh, and it's something I touched on with Randy Blythe when he was on uh, um, buddy of ours and Lamb of God singer and yeah great you know you guys are are, are are singing about that kind of shit which is which is really cool um, what is the greatest gift about being an armored saint and having your current job well the fact that I'm still doing this after how many years you know like I I'm honored and very grateful that I'm being I still able to do this you know 40 years later or whatever it is um I own that's all I've ever wanted from day one was to make it a career I you know I mean you all have high hopes of achieving different things and stuff like that but in the end the bottom line is that you just want to do what you love you know and be able to do it I've been very grateful to be in situations with other musicians and other bands and great players and people and a lot of friends and also family members that are that have supported me through all this you know even just psychologically you know um and i'm just you know the fact that i'm still doing this is just beyond me <laughs> <laughs> they're still talking about stuff like that happened in the 80s and people care you know that's it's amazing, you know. So to be, you know, I take a lot of pride in in uh, my legacy with the band, Armored Saint in particular, to answer your question more directly. Um, you know, we're very proud, and I think I speak for all of us, that um, 
we were able to kind of do this on our own terms. You know, we had a few, you know, hiccups along the way, but, and it's not been easy, but nothing in life is easy. Um, so as we all know, um, and so, you know, I just take a lot of pride in the fact that we have been able to do this on our own terms. And, um, you know, the, our band is kind of a unique situation sometimes, and I didn't really realize it until in the last 10 years or so, but we kind of were able to sort of carve out a little bit of a, our own musical niche and the type of music and the style of music that we, we create in this, within this realm of heavy metal, you know, and we, we did it without really kind of copying or following another band's coattails. We just sort of did this in our own meandering way and ended up here. And so the music that we're putting out now, I feel very, very proud of. And, you know, as you can tell, my excitement of just describing how I wrote Lone Wolf, you know, for instance, you know, we take uh, John and I in particular, we take great pride in, in the music that we write and, we feel like a lot of our fans have been, you know, very connected in that journey. And we can't do this without them, you know. Uh, we certainly aren't doing this just to satisfy only ourselves. We do want to satisfy ourselves primarily and first, but the fact that... There you go. Sorry. The fact that we are able to do this and have the fans come along for the ride and the journey and also support us what we do you know succeed, succeeding or not but um the fact that they're there is is an amazing thing and it's an amazing testament to their loyalty to us and you know we always try to give a shout out to our fans because without, without them it's just a couple of us writing songs in the bedroom and nobody hears it uh so you know i mean those are the things that i'm super grateful for you know um Again, it's like you, you can't ask for anything more than that. Being a musician, it's just the greatest thing. You guys never fail to acknowledge the fans and your appreciation for the fans. And I, I personally, I love it when bands put that out there, you know, whether it's in the linear notes in these albums or just right here, right now. Uh, it's awesome. Good shit, man. It's important. You got to, yeah. you know, this is a two way street. So it's yeah. not, a, it's not, it's not all about us. You know, it's about, it's about, us yes it's communal, yeah. it's communal. It's community yeah exactly and, and buffalo new york loves you i would love to have you come back and you know bring you some wings some of the best wings you ever have and you know some <laughs> Look wine forward to it some wine too uh don't forget the wine no no i can't can't forget the wine man uh, i think buffalo makes uh upstate new york makes great ice wine because uh, you guys have a lot of uh that's the, the weather there allows it to happen and uh, right am i right yep Yep, ice yeah. wine, uh, Rieslings, the Finger Lakes region uh, is mm -hmm. really pretty. Uh, the Niagara Wine Trail is a nice little, you know, half hour drive up. Canada is just, uh, we're, I'm downtown Buffalo, so it's just right over the mm -hmm. right over the border there. But my very last question for you, and I'll let you go, Joey. All right. Um, your three metal songs that give you the most goosebumps. <laughs> All right. Cheers. Um, well, there's a lot, so it would be, it, it depends on the, the time or the day of the week that you're asking me, but I'll give you three that kind of come to mind first. Um, I'm going to say Victim of Changes <laughs> by Priest, but the live version from uh, Unleashed in the East. Time and place for me, it's still just unbelievable. Goosebumps. Uh, Over My Head by King's X. Um, I can hear that song a million times and it'll always have this feeling of like, just again, goosebumps, this hair on the back of your neck. Amazing song, amazing performance by the band. I'm a huge King's X fan, as you can tell. And then let's go like really scary, like goosebumps being scared and we'll have to, we got to include Black Sabbath. Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath. You know, the, the first and most evil song ever made. And so, uh, you know, if that didn't scare the shit out of you, then okay, get out. Get out of the room. Go somewhere else. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, it's the best. Dig it. You know, when lyrics really create the imagery, uh, I was 15 listening to that shit in my headphones like, 
Oh yeah. You know, Satan's sitting there. He's smiling, eyes of fire. Fucking. Oh yeah. Satan laughing spreads his wings, and then it's and then he. And that's it. That's it. You're just done after that. That's it. You you <laughs> give up. You just give yourself over to fright. Right. Right. Oh yeah. Well, Motor Sister, new record, hopefully next year. You got a new record, Fate's Warning. Uh, you got the Symbol of Salvation coming up here next month, October the 22nd, the CD, DVD. Check it out. Great. You know, you talk about King's X real quick. Dude, I don't know anything about that band, honestly. I'll admit it. I want to check that song. I'm going to blast that right about now. Oh, yeah. But, um, Last Train Home, that is my favorite song for the past year, man. That's one of those songs when I'm bummed when that song ends it's like oh i'm gonna go put it on again (laughs) (laughs) oh that's good yeah man thank you love it and uh keep rocking man stay safe and uh it really shows a lot of character of you coming to hang out with me so look forward to meet you in the in for real in the person in flesh and and get you some wine or something yeah sounds good i appreciate it thank you for this uh opportunity and nice conversation and uh I wish you well as well. Be safe. And I look forward to yeah meeting you in person. <laughs> Thanks, Joey. And uh, it, viewers, uh, stay happy, stay healthy, stay hungry, stay heavy. See you, man. Thank you. Have a good one. Too. Bye. Peace.